Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome to, to this morning's webinar session entitled Effective Reading Strategies for the Classroom and Beyond. I'd like to uh, introduce you to Sally Lane and to Maria Sharalambus, both members of our academic English team, who've got extensive experience in the areas of ELICOS and uh, reading skills. And I'd also like to congratulate Maria on her recent appointment um, uh, as a, a learning advisor. Some other things, I recommend that you use the chat bar in the session if you've got any insights or observations and please share with us so that we ha can have a back channel operating during the session. And from there, please, Maria and Sally. Thank you, John, for that warm intro introduction. I'm Maria. And I'm Sally, and um, so lovely to see so many of you here. So thanks for coming along today. Um, our session is on reading, as you can see on the screen. Um, and these are our aims today. So our first aim is to think about how to best give our students the skills they need to approach reading material at university. And we've got some really practical ideas that you can adapt your reading text with um, to create useful pre, during and after reading activities for your students. We also want to explore nurturing the reading skills that will serve the students, not only at university, but throughout their careers. So we've, um, we are already effective readers because we're university teachers. Um, and we have a warmer for you today. I would like you to look at these things that um, are different types of text and we're going to circle the ones that we've already read. But as you're circling, could you please just have a think about how you read that today? Because we don't read in the same way. Maybe you were skimming for the basic meaning. Maybe you were scanning for particular details. Maybe you were reading really closely. So just if we just um, circle the ones that um, we've read today and think about how you read them, please. John, did you read a novel this morning? <laughs> Uh, no, I didn't. That someone else has been oh. on the novel. Yeah. <laughs> wow, there's been a lot of reading going on. I think um, we know that we're not reading things in the same way, but it's not always immediately clear to our students. And that might cause them some despair when they're trying to read an academic text. They might not re realise that they have to read selectively. Thank you. Okay, so when we say this to our students, we sometimes put our head in our hands and think, why, why won't they? Why doesn't that work? Why can't we say that? At university level, learning often relies on tackling texts that are really quite challenging, often very long, and mm, often quite dry too. And it would be fantastic if we could say this to our students. And one day we will be able to, after this workshop. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I don't know about you, but this has often happened to me when I ask students to read something in class. Um, suddenly the dynamic goes from active to passive. Um, yet extensive reading is essential for success at university. And our role is to help our students engage with the material. And we can certainly use the classroom environment to our advantage. So we were sort of thinking about why the students won't just read the source material or probably more importantly, why can't they? So can we take a moment to share here and please type into the chat bar why you think sometimes students avoid reading. Yeah, everyone's attention span is becoming shorter with smartphones. We know that, don't we? So. Yeah. Yeah, and I think too many students are reading 
passively and, and failing to construct the meaning and gather the meaning as they go along. And I think they're seeing it as a very linear process. And I mean, and if you're starting with your finger under the first word and you know you've got 27 pages to read, that's soon going to become very onerous. So these are some of the reasons we serve. So we get our students to read in class for a number of reasons. And by working with their peers, they can unpack the meaning together and explore the topic before they even look at the text. And this will help get through that difficult context like Liz pointed out. Uh, please have a read of this quote. We think it's really useful for our context. Uh, we, we all know that our students do know how to read, but many have not learned the essential sub-skills that they, they need for university success. And unfortunately, there's a false assumption that students can or do have good reading skills when they come to university. Often when we look at a poor piece of assessment writing, it's not just the writing that needs work, but it's quite clear that the student hasn't understood the key concepts in the text that they've used for the assessment. So we, as I said right at the beginning, we know that just um, by definition of our job and our position, we know that we've already done some effective reading to get where we are, the lofty heights of where we are today. So we know that there are skills that we carry to be an effective reader, and a lot of our students don't. Again, could you just please start to share um, what makes you a good reader? And share that into the chat bar again, please. Yeah, there's some um, spot on answers there. Absolutely. And I really like in the, the focus on purpose. And I think that's something that the students don't realise and because it, it's never been made explicit to them. And I don't think there's any harm in making it explicit. I think we actually have to train our students. Um, otherwise, they're just going to get bogged down in the you know, reading they have to do at university level. Thanks, everyone. So we were considering the ideas that we had to, of the skills that make you an effective reader. And of course, we know that as we read, we have to build the meaning in our heads and carry that with us. It's also important to skim read for basic meaning. So this is where we read a text quite quickly so that we can understand the overall gist of the text. And as um, a few of you said in the chat, but understanding the purpose of the reading can really inf inform the purpose of why you are reading it. Um, it's it, not everything in that whole text is going to demand the same level of focus. So if you understand why it's been written, why you need to read it, it's going to um, help you plough your way through it. Um, as does or understanding how the text is organised and that this will help us and our students know how to approach the text and whether they need to read the whole thing or just the topic sentences. And Sorry. And simple strategies, like concrete strategies, like pulling out the topic sentence. Also, thinking critically while reading. So, for example, who benefits from this strategy or what are the strengths and weaknesses of the argument or when is this type of idea acceptable? Any of those WH questions. And being able to retain the meaning in in the head so to carry the meaning across from word to, to word from sentence to sentence paragraph to paragraph and uh, recognize the meaning and function of of connecting words uh, for example um, cause and effect language or, or discourse markers like therefore that suggests a result will follow the importance of prediction um, and using what they already know to be able to predict what's going to come up in terms of ideas and language. Also the importance of looking backwards and forwards in a text to, to get the meaning and, and not 
just having to read in a linear process. And appreciating, just like we did with the warmer then, that you don't read every genre of text in exactly the same way. You know, a, a text message from a loved one you'd read closely, but a, a 27 page academic text, you're gonna have to read selectively, um, probably use a skimming and scanning there. And skipping over words that we don't know in a text and still being able to get the meaning of the overall text or section. And of course, recording information as they go, that's something I think we should be explicitly encouraging our students to do because no good reading those 27 pages and then thinking what was in that. So get them to take notes as they go. That's a really effective strategy. So today we're looking at um, reading in terms of three stages. The before stage, what they do with the text during it and afterwards as well. And throughout all these three stages we want our students to be active and an active approach can actually save time like lots of students think oh you don't have to go back and read it again it's a waste of time actually it, it when you go back and keep attacking the text you're selectively reading the bits that are appropriate for you and your study and you might only be reading a percentage of what others are plowing through with their finger under every word and they're plowing through it mindlessly. So it's much better to just keep going back in, dipping in and out, but being a selective reader because active reading involves thinking about it, not just um, mindless reading or memorizing. So we start with the pre-stage. And we really need to start from where our students are. So find out what they already know about the topic and, and build on that. So letting students share their existing ideas about the topic will give their confidence and empower them. And as we know before we read, we need context. So we can show the title and the source and elicit predictions about the content as one example. And with scaffolding the text, we're not just letting them go on their own, we're helping them. Yeah, so we need to ensure that we're scaffolding so that the reading texts are accessible, as we know that they're, they're quite difficult at university level. And by scaffolding, it, it ensures that we're supporting the students, especially when the material is quite challenging. Um, students, I think, need concrete, easier questions before ex dealing with harder ones. And um, we put that title up there, scaffolding is not dumbing down, because we're not changing the text in any way, we're just making it more accessible for students. So we've got some um, activities coming up for us all to join in. So I I'd like to refer back to that speech bubble at the beginning that said, please read this article and why that doesn't work. And I'd like you all to please read the text that's going to come up on your screen and suggest the title for it. You have, I don't know, 30 seconds. Read this short text and suggest a title for it. Please use the chat bar to put your recommendations. Okay, thank you. All across that, everyone understood? Yes, no? How about if I do this? Understand it better now? Yeah. <laughs> so, simple things like just adding a title can give so much context because you, what you're doing is um, activating all that schemata that the students are carrying in their heads and they're already predicting the language they know, they've got an idea of what's going to what the te text type is going to be it's going to be factual it's 
it's going to be like a process. You know, you, you're giving them so many clues before they've even um, started reading the text. So this is another variation. You could um, get them to engage even more with the context by getting them to work it out. Okay, here's another text that we'd like you to read. Uh, can you spend the next 30 seconds or so reading through this text? And then uh, please type into the chat bar what you think the context is or the place. Thanks, Kylie. And how did you know it was a classroom? <laughs> Anti vocabulary. <laughs> Good. Yeah, you're right. It's a classroom. It's it, I don't know if it's a maths lesson, but it's definitely some kind of lesson. Um, so we just looked at two examples of text that students, I mean, not, of course, they've made up words in there, but two examples of text and situations where students might find it difficult to engage with that text, but for very different reasons. Um, in the first text about the windscreen wipers, we understood every single word in that text. There were no difficult words in that text, but we didn't have any um, context. We didn't have any background knowledge that would make our understanding easier. We didn't, we didn't have any top-down knowledge. In the second example, we knew the background. It was really easy to find the context and the general topic, but we lacked the lexical knowledge. So we lacked, we lacked the, the bottom-up knowledge. And, and that's why we need both when we're reading. And we can help our students with a complex text by giving them that kind of scaffolding. And we can help them understand essential and non-essential information and the significance of, of different words and especially cohesive devices to show how the text is connected. Because if, we, if, we, if we're going to help them out by giving them the context, getting them to think about the the general topic or giving them some bottom-up knowledge like unpacking some of the vocabulary that's difficult for them. If they feel they've got a little map, a roadmap to direct them through the text, they're not going to give up with that reading. And I know I've just done an assignment with my class and a lot of them said I read the first paragraph and gave up. And I just think it's that they haven't had enough um, strategies pointed out to them. So, oh. Yeah, go on. Have a look at this um, heading. Just from the headline, we can understand whether it's positive or negative, academic or not, how long it's likely to be, the type of text. We can bring our own prior knowledge to the text. So even if we're, as we're reading, we get stuck on a word or a concept, by building this top-down knowledge, it can help us carry us through the difficult text. And we talked before about them predicting and getting our students to, to predict. It's not just ideas, it's also the language in there as well. And we're doing it consciously and subconsciously. Students are not empty vessels when we get them. They've already got some knowledge of the world and it's sort of, sounds cheesy, but it's connecting the word to the world. It's getting them to predict what they're gonna be reading about. And reading is about checking those predictions. There's lots of different ways you can do this. This is one way. It's from a website called Word Cloud. You can type in the key vocabulary from the text and it organises it into a graphic like this. Uh, the words that are bigger, we've typed in more times and that's why they appear bigger. Um, so this is what the site looks like. And you can see there's an arrow pointing down to the wizard. 
that's where you type the words in and it gives you step-by-step -step instructions on how to do it. So with this one, we use the, the key vocabs on that text. Um, but there's other ways of doing it as well. And another way is to use pictures. And it might generate some discussion. And of course, while they're discussing, you're hoping that they're bringing up that key language and getting their minds into that um, subject area. You can use quotes. I've done it with quotes before. You can uh, turn the title into the question and get students to think about WH questions. For example, what is crowd psychology? Uh, what are the current methods of policing crowds in Australia? And then this is a nice idea, sort of ideas tennis, where you put students into pairs and give them, and it's important to give them quite a short time limit for this, but say that one minute to bat ideas between each other um, on this topic. So say everything you know in one minute. And it's important to give a short time because some of our students won't have anything to say but the beauty of this is that, that every pair in the classroom is doing it at the same time so they'll overhear ideas and it might just spark some language or some content from um from hearing other people this is another strategy so after looking at the heading and some of the keywords uh, you can get students in pairs to write down three questions that they want answered uh, from the text once they've read it so incentive for, for reading on. And uh, this is the uh, want to know stage of the KWL table, which is used for reading in schools. And we can um, use this table for the, for the different stages. So the know already is the, is the pre-stage where we're predicting and connecting ideas. The one to know is what we want to learn from the text and learnt is the post stage. But if, if they've already used it at school, they, we don't want our students to feel that they're still back at school. They've progressed. So you can just do something sneaky and change the language around it. But it's the same principle, really. Um, something else you can do before with a text. This is a really useful strategy that we can all do is to adapt the text, use a skeleton text, and you're just leaving in the key uh, meaning, the key words that are rich in meaning there. So taking out all the prepositions and the small grammar words. Um, it just makes, it breaks it down. It makes the reading a bit um, more easy to tackle for the students. But I'm really going to emphasize here, we don't want to creating loads of extra work for ourselves. So you can just um, blank out words with whiteout or a black marker or use the replace option in Word as well. We'll do that for you. And this is a variation of that activity. So students don't want to do the same activity all the time, but we don't have to reinvent the wheel, just tweak them slightly. So we can take out some different words and put in a few letters to help them guess the words that are missing. These type of activities help to facilitate the reading of long academic texts as they're not quite there on their own yet. So we'd like, there's quite a few ideas there, but we'd like you to share with everyone here today, um, what kind of activities are you already using in your classes? I want to steal them. <laughs> um, what, what do you do if you have that 27 page text that you need them to read what well, how would you broach it with them and i think we'll take three minutes or so to type our answers into the chat bar because this will be really useful to do some sharing i think yeah i like that one from sarah that's um it just it's anything that makes them feel that it's manageable i think we have to break it down for them because it's quite daunting and intimidating i think Okay, lovely. Thank you. There's some fantastic ideas. And it's nice to see we're all doing this already. I think it's just sometimes nice to make it explicit to the students what we're doing as well. You know, it's just because they, when they're left on their own to go off and read a text, they're going to be needing to activate their own brain into doing this kind of thing. So now this takes us to the middle stage of reading. 
So we've got a couple of different strategies for after the, the pre-reading stage where, where students are actually reading the text. And there are different ways of doing this. One of the ideas we've got is a jigsaw reading. So I'm sure most of you have heard of it already. It's where you take a longer piece of text and divide it into sections and place students into small groups, say three or four people. Each person in the group gets a section of the text which they read and take notes about, uh, summarise and then share their section of the text with the rest of the group. And so by the end of the, the activity, the, every student in the group has got the whole text, but they've also worked on their summarising skills, finding synonyms, note-taking skills, and it's also helping build community in the classroom and harnessing those soft communication skills that um, are so important. And we can get them to examine the text, bits of the text, the whole text in lots of different ways, you know, finding synonymous language, so at word level, paraphrasing at sentence level, and then at macro level, they can summarise the whole text. And before we, we automatically jump to a written summary, I think um, this is a useful activity. Oh yes, um, we can we can get elicit the keywords from the students after they've discussed it, the text with their partner or small groups. Write them up on the whiteboard. Um, pair students up again with a different partner or with the same partner, and they need to retell the text again using the vocab on the board. This activity can lead to a written summary. Um, it also gives them a chance to use some of the vocab in the text, which is related to uh, the subject that they are studying. Often students feel a bit uncomfortable with new vocab, so we need to give them enough practice with it. And if, um if we put some prompt questions as they read, it's almost as if they've got a teacher sitting next to them and just keep adding those questions to a text will eventually lead to them asking themselves those kinds of questions and getting them to think critically about the text as they go through. So we've that the mixture of questions, some concrete questions, some higher order um, questions as well. And as they read through, they're, they're gaining confidence to persevere. Please have a look at this um, quote. We think it really sums up the importance of explicit reading training at the college and at university because there's so much reading to be done at uni, despite what you're studying, and students need help with their reading skills at the level that we have them. And we can assist them in learning to read quickly um, for GIST. So there, there's a PowerPoint facility that you can use for speed reading, speed reading training. Um, Let's have a look at this. We'd like you to read this, please, and tell us the context. Okay, and we all know the answer because we've done it before, but you can see that the text is disappearing from the screen. It's up to you how quickly you make that text disappear. So, you know, over the process of a course, you could you could up the speed and get them reading quite quickly for the gist, for the basic meaning. We also have to be uh, clever about how we structure our questions because we need to structure our, our questions in a way that we can ascertain whether the students have understood the meaning of the text. So have a read of this, please, and then answer the questions.
So it's possible to answer all these questions, isn't it? Uh, and still not understand the text. But by being careful with the type of questions we ask our students, we'll, we'll be able to determine whether the students have actually comprehended the meaning. Um, so uh, perhaps questions like this, these questions that follow are more effective. And they're known as concept checking questions because they actually do test whether somebody has understood that meaning correctly and fully. So what does jambering sound like? What kind of river roll was it? Where do you usually see pompings? That would really test whether the students have understood it rather than just regurgitating the text. Another um, strategy that I think is really useful at tertiary level is to find two texts about the same thing um, and get students to do some kind of comparison and not just in terms of topic, but in terms of style, register, the academic devices used in it, credibility, bias, and the typical features of academic writing. And it's really useful for them at this stage to, to be able to compare what's a factual text with what's evaluative or critical, and to maybe follow how a hypothesis is developed throughout a report, how results are reported, and to compare um, two writers' different perspectives. Another useful activity is to get students to work together on their tables and uh, create a quiz using the content in the, in the text. This uh, activity can be done at the reading stage, but it can also be a post activity that's done afterwards. So th these type of activities make the students keep revisiting the text, but it's quite a fun way of revisiting the text. And we know that we do have to revisit, um, not just for vocab, but for, for ideas to stick in our heads as well. And it's not a waste of time. And I think that if we need to be explicit with the students about that. It's not a waste of time. Um, often students are really uncomfortable, as Maria said, with that level of formality that they find in an academic text. And even when we feed them that sophisticated language, they're still not comfortable with using it. So we want them to own that language so that they can reproduce it in their essays or their writings. So keep, keep um, exposing them to, the, to those words in that context is going to allow them to feel at ease and we need to find lots of opportunities for them to use it, invite them to use that language in their own writing. Yeah, and not only for writing but also in oral presentations. I, I think um, other teachers would have had a similar experience. We often feed students some of the sentence stems for their um, oral presentations but they don't use them when presenting. And, and I often wonder if this is because they feel uncomfortable with uh, formal vocab. So they need to keep revisiting it and add it to their own um, vocabulary set so they feel comfortable using new words. The one strategy we found when we were researching is, is a very effective way of breaking down the text without dumbing it down. And it's really useful for particularly complex and, and lengthy texts that are overwhelming for one student on their own. This, this thing called reciprocal teaching. Um, it's a strategy where students work in small groups and each member of the group has a different role that's clearly defined. So for example, uh, the clarifier identifies any difficult vocabulary. Uh, the questioner writes down inference questions. Um, but it's important to go over the usefulness of these questions first uh, before setting up the, the activity. So, for example, um, if I asked students how many people died in the battle, uh, I'd probably get the right answer, but I wouldn't know if students understood the, the text. Um, however, if I ask what is the significance of the number, uh, I'm better able to gauge whether students have understood the implications within the text. So after the first section has been done, you can get students to rotate. And so each person in the group has, has a chance to, to be one of the other roles or do one of the other roles. Um, it works best if it's done as a whole class activity first, 
with the teacher being the leader and walking the students through the activity. And, and the teacher can do this uh, with the first, say, two paragraphs of a longer text. And then um, a person in each of the groups can become the leader within, within each table. And research shows that if this activity is done in class, students actually uh, use these skills when they're reading at home. And, and this is research done on university students. So it's a really great uh, classroom activity for our students. And that's what it would look like. You'd give each student a different card or a different piece of paper, and then the, everybody gets a copy of a text, whatever that text may, may be. Um, and as Maria said, it's not set in stone. Get the students to, to take on different roles each time. Um, it really gets them thinking about how to approach a reading and what they should be thinking about and the questions they need to be asking themselves at tertiary level. It of course makes them an active reader and they know that the group is depending on them so they're not gonna um, let their group down. It, it, it gets them to ask those questions as they go through the text, a little bit like the teacher's prompt questions that we wrote on that text in red before. It's very important for harnessing the group, um, keeping that bonding going in the classroom, making them feel that they are part of a group. And of course, it's just, you know, it's helping our students in university and beyond and to, to take responsibility for their own learning, becoming active learners. So it, now we're up to the last stage. So after, after the reading of the text has been done, and often it's really tempting to just move on to a totally different activity especially when you've just gotten through quite a tough text. But it can be really useful to dissect the text afterwards and do something with it and discover, um, for example, any bias in the text. And you can do this in different ways. For example, get the students to write an email to the author or you know, structure an email but not send it or come up with a quiz like we spoke about before. Uh, here are some other critical thinking strategies that can be done as post activities. And I think we put a lot of attention into the after the reading sometimes, but it's often usually just write a summary of, of the text. It's often just written stuff and I think they can get a lot out of a discussion after the text as well. Um, the kinds of questions that we should be encouraging our students to ask are the things that maybe come naturally to us, but I think sometimes it's quite useful to keep a bank of questions that you can pull out and adapt to each text. This is um, a list of questions that would connect that individual text to the whole um, area of study. We can make these available to you afterwards if, you, if anybody wants a list of these. There are also these critical thinking questions. You know, and having something like a class debate is sometimes quite intimidating for teachers to set up, especially with um, the apparent levels of motivation of some of our students at times but it, it, you can get so much um, excellent participation out of students who otherwise might just sit there and not contribute and I think once they've read the text they've got some ideas they've got some language and it's just a way of practicing that really okay okay so um these ideas, the idea, sorry, is not that we're going to hold their hand throughout the whole text, but it's just that we should support students and there are effective strategies for supporting students all the way through a reading text. And so that one day we will be able to say, please read this article and they will be able to do it on their own. They're just not there quite yet and I think we can help them. So in summary, I would say that we should be thinking of our reading 
in three stages with active participation at every stage. You know, let's not allow them to be passive and, and just sit there receiving information from the teacher. We need to explicitly set the context and get students to help us set the context before we even look at the text. And recognise that they might, they might know a bit more than you on this topic or they might have some outside experience that they could bring to the class and that all this collaborating and sharing of experience and vocab is only going to enrich the class's um, experience. We need to be selective of our tasks so that they can support our, our learners and then help build their understanding of the text and, and deeper ideas. And be explicit in training them um, in the kind of questions they need to be asking themselves so that they do become effective readers like us. Um, selective readers as well. They don't have to read every word of a 27 page text every time and critical readers to think as they're reading. And that reading at tertiary level is, is active. It shouldn't be passive. And there's a lot of talk in education of the, of the 21st century skills that the schools have adopted. And um, there are a lot more qualities, but we picked on the four C's communication, creativity, collaboration, and critical thinking. And we might think, oh, but that, that doesn't come into reading. Reading is passive. Well, hopefully we've shown you that it doesn't have to be passive and it should, shouldn't be passive at this level and that it can actually foster all of those things if done correctly in the classroom. And it could be fun as well. So thank you very much, everyone. Do you have any questions? So anything that people would like to say, I can click on the chat bar now. I couldn't do it before and advance the slides. So I've missed a lot of the discussion. I think. Oh, people have been going gangbusters on the discussion. Um, but I would encourage everybody that now is a good time to any observations that you would like to make or anything that you've seen that you would like to add to on the topic of improving our students' reading skills, please. Oh, I'd, I'd just like to make a comment. Um, in maths, like in, in English, the focus is always on teaching students to skim the text. And when we're in maths, we then have a problem because they don't, they skim it and they don't realise that in maths, every single word implies a number of things. So you, you have to then get them out of the habit of skimming so that they will read it with meaning and think about, okay, it's a square, but you know, they, you don't need to skim over because being a square tells you lots of things. It tells you it has four equal sides, it has four 90 degree angles, you know, it's a quadrilateral, it's, uh, it tells you lots of other things. And it's really difficult when they all skim to get them back. Absolutely, Linda, and we don't suggest skimming a text that we're going to use or look at in depth. But it can be a strategy, for example, when looking at a lot of different texts and deciding which two you're going to use. Sorry, I'm, I'm not suggesting you, you, you are telling them to skim all the time. All I'm telling you is what we then see. Um, my my daughter's doing HSC maths at the moment and she skims the questions and gets them wrong. She doesn't read all the... Yeah, they don't read the instructions. So I think sometimes, you know, just pointing out or doing some activity like our warmer at the beginning can help people realise that you don't read everything in the same way and that how they read a text message from their boyfriend is they're going to be reading every word closely and they're not going to be reading a bus timetable. Yeah. The bus is from Bondi to the city if they live in... Marrickville you know it's I think actually making them realize that that it, reading isn't just reading it's read there's lots of different ways that you can read and I yeah. think yeah um blanking out questions in a maths question and getting them to suggest what goes in there I don't know anything that gets them really focusing on reading at word level and making meaning of a whole maths problem or something mm -hmm. Uh, can yeah. you stop sharing? Can you stop sharing there so we can yeah. see the whole family, please? Um, yep. Yeah.
That's awesome. Any other observations? Liz. What can he? Oh, sorry. Can you turn on your microphone again, Liz? Yeah, you, for some reason, your microphone. There you go. Um, yes, thank you, uh, Maria and Sally. That was really helpful. That's my phone going off. Um, I actually have to get it. <laughs> I'm waiting for an important call. So can I apologise? I'm really sorry. Absolutely. No Gabriella. Um, sorry. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I just, I, I was just interested in the list of critical questions, which is really useful, and I think we can use it in the classroom. So, uh, but apart from that, uh, well, that was really interesting and really useful, especially for the challenging English units that we deliver. So, yeah, I really find it interesting. And I wish I wish you could share it with all our teachers, Sally and Maria. It would be, yeah, it would really be beneficial. So maybe at some point you could, maybe you could maybe uh, create a document if, if it's not possible to uh, communicate it in this way, uh, in a verbal way, maybe creating a document with all the steps that the text needs to be yeah. broken into, and that would really be useful, especially for intro to AC2. Yeah. Um, yeah. So thanks for that. Yes. Will do. Thanks, Gabriella. I just, I'd like to pick up Sarah's point there because that's something that's so common. The, what is my opinion? I don't know what I think about this. I don't, I don't know anything about policing and crowd protests and things, as an example. And I'd, I'd like to go back to, I can't remember who said, but they show a video before they even read the text. And yeah. I think often we're so keen to jump into the readings and we, we don't spend enough time making them feel comfortable around the topic because sometimes just time constraints as well. But, you know, show videos, get them interested, get them to realise, oh, actually, I might have an opinion. But I do agree that's the challenge. Because, you know, they're 18, 19 years old. They haven't got as much life experience as us. Absolutely. And also sometimes getting them to share their opinion with their partner or their table can make them more confident to share their opinion with the class. Um, and it kind of validates their opinion if, if their peers can understand what they're saying. Sorry, Maria. Even if they don't, if they really don't have an opinion, I've... In the past, I've done a debate in little tables, not a whole class debate, because I think that's a bit daunting sometimes, but given them a roll card with what they believe on it. And so they've got that confidence. It's like acting. They're, they're arguing a point. And when everybody around the table starts arguing, they can form inside their own opinions. I've, I've done that before. And I think they will sit there mute when they're being asked for their real opinion, but if you give them a roll card, suddenly they're very brave and it's funny and they love to be quite extreme in their opinions. And while everyone's doing that, they've got that space to form their own um, or realise their own opinion. I'm currently teaching at Kingswood um, at the university, not at the college. And they're, they've redesigned the tutorials to be in two hour formats with 48 students. It's a flipped learning model. So at what point would we be able to help the students with the reading in the tutorial if they're expected to have already read the material beforehand? That's yeah. a really good question. Uh, um, can I, can I, got his hand up. can oh. I come in there? That sounds like an, a great opportunity to talk about the KWL model. Uh, what do I know about this? They've looked at something already. They've, they're supposed to have prepared in the <laughs> So starting off the session with what do you know about this already? Yeah. Um, what do you want to know about it? And you're building a schema and it's something you can talk to. You can bounce questions off. You can get them to compare their ideas. And it's a really strong, uh, it's, 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 it's a well-proven strategy. And I think it fits very well with uh, the, the case that you're describing, yeah. Sarah. Okay. And, and at, at the end, again, there's the rounding off activity. What did I learn? What, you know, what, it's not just read this, it's interesting, but yeah. you, you're rounding it up. You know, what did I get out of this? Mm -hmm. You know, whether it's a critical perspective or just a factual perspective. 
And also, if in the flipped model, you could actually use reciprocal teaching and give everybody a, you know, if they've got the same text, put them into groups before they go home, they read it at home with one roll card, come back and then have a, have a discussion about the text then. I think that I could see that working. Yeah, the, pro the problem is though the following week or the following fortnight's different material, so we don't have the chance to actually go back over it. Any of those um, pre-reading activities could be set for homework with the text as well. So they can be given a video to watch or you can send them the word cloud or all those pre-reading uh, ideas to, to activate their knowledge. Um, you could also use the, the discussion board on Blackboard to mm -hmm. facilitate the reciprocal teaching. So yeah, that's place good. students into small groups and get them to do it that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, any, any um, WhatsApp group in their groups or anything like that where they can share ideas. I think it's just to be sent off with a, a really complex reading is quite daunting for them sometimes, especially if they're not, you know, they didn't do particularly well at school and they're feeling that, they, that they've got imposter syndrome, they shouldn't be at uni and, you know, it can be, it can put them off. <laughs> Yeah, the, 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 other, the other issue is that there are some students who have gone through all the material and there's ones who will turn up and, and openly admit I've done absolutely nothing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so we, we, we do have to manage that um, with the tutors not preparing the lecture material. It's prepared by someone else. And so we can't really say, oh, can you do this before the next class? Because invariably... 95% of them won't do anything or they'll just skim the lecture and go, oh, yeah, I think I've got an idea about it. And David, you want to come in on that? Um, I was just thinking you could use Kahoot, which was mentioned earlier in the chat. So you could start by trying to, uh, a couple of questions that relate to the text that the students have to respond to. Um, so just to get a sense of their um, preparedness or you could turn it around as some of the classes have done and have the students um, develop the questions, which then they either place in Kahoot themselves or give to you. And so those questions then get posed back to the rest of the class. So you're using the strengths and the skills of those who've actually done some reading to benefit everybody. I'd like to thank Maria and Sally for putting a lot of preparation and thought into this and also for coming around to the space where they're really, really comfortable with sharing the strategies, the activities that they are aware of that, you know, will help all our colleagues develop reading skills in our, in, in our students. So thank you very much, Maria and Sally, for your time. So before I finish off, David, you want to, a closing statement? I just wanted to say Maria and Sally, I really liked the way that you basically bounced to get together with um, picking up the conversation one after the other. It was very effective. It was really lovely. Thank you. <laughs> There's a bit of planning involved in that. <laughs> so slick, aren't we? <laughs> David. Yes, I, I would endorse that, David. So again, thank you very much, Maria and Sally, and I look forward to your future webinars. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone, for you. Thank okay. you for coming. Thank you. Thanks, and thank you, everybody, for being here also. Uh, we do appreciate your uh, support. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.